coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Alban Sumana, Kingsford Bagwin, asserts the autonomy and authority of Parliament and takes on the judiciary and the executive arms of government on what he says is a collusion between the two to weaken Parliament. Uh, we have all the details for you. Dennis Barber, Wadam Esquire is here with me. And Dennis, the whole, could say the whole country and beyond were paying rough attention to the speaker earlier today. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. you have specific pointers on some of the issues that he raised. Well, what are yeah, those? Yeah, yeah. So the speaker has not exactly been happy with developments, especially as has to do with the House. And the House, I mean, the House of Parliament. So today he's been speaking to some of those issues, some of which he says are... A threat to our democracy, our democracy if we do not pay attention to them. He mm. first off starts by asserting the autonomy of the House to say that the House as an arm of government um, has the right to do things without any unnecessary interference. He, he goes on to make the case that as far as he's concerned, mm -hmm. there's no constitutional crisis. And you know where this is coming from. Absolutely. This on the back of the a statement by the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. when she stated that we are in a constitutional crisis sure. uh, for which reason parliament is unable to sit. Mind you, when she said that statement, um, lawyer for the Speaker of Parliament drew her attention to the fact that they were not in court because they wanted parliament to sit, and she actually withdrew that statement. But the Speaker has been responding to that to say that mm -hmm. we do not have constitutional crisis because the Constitution sets out processes and procedures for how things are supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. He says that as far as he's concerned, those processes have been triggered and that is the reason some people have gone to court and all that. So um, for him, I mean, Parliament is functioning and it's running right. and there's no constitutional crisis. Um, we, we, we let's we let's, let's, let's hear exactly what the Speaker said on that score. There is no constitutional crisis in this country. I repeat, there is no constitutional crisis in this country. The Parliament of Ghana is alive and working. Let nobody mislead, misinform, or disinform you and the country. The democratic system we adopted and enacted as captured in the Constitution 1992 and fleshed out in various laws, processes, procedures, and practices is what has been triggered and it is working. Let us allow it to work. Democracy it's about the rule of law. Let the law work. The democratic system we adopted and enacted recognizes that in the course of operationalizing the system, disagreements will occur. The Speaker of Parliament there, in fact, asserting the point that there is no constitutional crisis the Chief Justice was quite clear in her words. Parliament is not sitting in her words as constitutional crisis. Yes. What next? Well, so in reference to that, the Speaker makes the um, case that, I mean, Parliament as a house in itself is capable of solving its own um, internal issues, like mm -hmm. he did in Ikit, that once in a while there may be issues of disagreements, but when those disagreements arise, the house can deal with them without necessarily resorting to he makes the case that it is becoming increasingly worrying that some members of parliament, who in his view should know better, mm -hmm. uh, at the least opportunity would run to the Supreme Court to seek what he calls favorable judgments. And that, in his view, is gradually weakening the House. He makes reference to certain provisions of the Constitution, which he says are the basis for which, I mean, parliament should be able to operate on its own without any unnecessary interference. He makes mm -hmm. reference to Article 115 which says that there shall be freedom of speech, debate, and processes in Parliament, and that, and that freedom shall not be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. Right. He proceeds to um, cite parts of Article 116.1, which says that subject to provisions of this article, but without prejudice to the general effect of Article 115 of this Constitution, 
civil or criminal proceedings shall not be initiated against the member of parliament in any court or place out of parliament for any matter or thing brought by him in or before parliament by petition, bill, motion, otherwise. All this was to the effect that, I mean, things that happen in parliament mm -hmm. should remain this in parliament. Remain and this is part. some sort of protection that the constitution grants parliament in that particular regard. Now, the other thing that was also key in the speaker's uh, presentation was the fact that, that justice needs not just be done, it has to be seen to be done. be done. He makes this case because he thinks that some cases have been handled differently. He makes reference to the anti-LGBT case, mm -hmm. where he says that in his view, um, that case has been on the table of the Supreme Court for a very long time, but when it got to the case of this ex-party application by the majority leader, I mean, as it's on the face of the writ, there was a certain sense of agency, or it was dealt with swiftly. Right. He says that that sense of agency should also be attached to this particular uh, uh, matter of the anti-LGBTQ uh, bill that is now before the court. We have him saying that. Let, let's yes, listen we, to the we speaker have, we have, we on have that, that particular point that he made earlier today. Sure. When my predecessor declared the formula seat vacant in 2020, applying the same provisions of Act 97, the original tradition of the Supreme Court to interpret and enforce provisions of the Constitution was not invoked. Peace reigned in these instances, and nobody cried and ran to the Supreme Court under the guise of constitutional interpretation. If I may ask, is it a legal matter for the Supreme Court to decide as to which side of the House constitute the majority or minority? It is for good reason that justice is said to be blind. And further, that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done in all cases not in only those cases to which some people appear to be sentimentally attached. Fellow Ghanaians, I respectfully call on the Supreme Court to apply the same swiftness with which the motion ex parte in the Eastern matter was granted to the case involving the President's refusal to receive the Human Rights and Family Values Bill passed by Parliament which has been pending before the same court for almost a year would have been heard. Oh, uh, uh, for some time now, a number of persons who have been commenting on this matter, Dennis, have made reference to the, the South situation and yeah. the fact that they have not had, rep had representation for this long, mm -hmm. as against the Chief Justice's concerns about these constituents in the four MPs, yes, MPs. affected sure. not having representation for about five, six weeks. Yeah. What did the speaker say on that? Well, so the speaker seemed to be saying that, I mean, if the argument of the Supreme Court was that some people were not going to have representation for the remaining part of the life of parliament, mm -hmm. then the Supreme Court ought to have also acknowledged the fact that a certain constituency, that's Sal in question, have not had representation for the entire life of parliament. And that also in the case of the uh, Asin North situation, the member of parliament was also injuncted and those people were not represented in parliament. So that's where he begins to make the point that if justice must be done, it must not just be done, it must be seen to be done. And that's also the case he, he makes when he seems to be suggesting that there's some kind of um, selective justice because he makes the case that, or double standard, if I may put it that way, mm -hmm. he makes the case that when he made a ruling on the case of some three members of parliament who were absent from parliament for some time, right. they did not raise eyebrows that when his predecessor made a ruling using the same provision of Article 97 to declare the formula seat then vacant, he did not see anybody rising to go to the Supreme Court to seek interpretation. So why is it the case now? He does not think that it is right to strengthen parliament. So he, he, he thinks that moving forward, I mean, care has to be taken on that particular score. Well, let's hear from the speaker on this, and I'll have... Martin Pebble, private legal practitioner, Dr. Rashid Rahman, executive of the Africa Centre for Parliamentary Affairs. Both are going to be joining me right now. But let's take a listen to the speaker on this. Ladies and gentlemen, consistency is not just an ideal, but the foundation of life. 
The court cannot enjoin four members of parliament from serving their constituents for 12 weeks, but was very eager to deny the constituents of Asin North their representation because of the issue of allegiance. The court cannot deny the constituents of SAL the sanctity of representation for years. The court cannot even see that the constitution itself permits a denial of representation within three months to the holding of a general election. It's in the constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parliament of Ghana shall commence sitting as by law prescribed from tomorrow, November 7th, 2024. I have earlier instructed the clerk to Parliament to transmit the LGBTQ plus bill to the president for assent. Well, so that's the speaker there. In fact, I cited a number of things. Tomorrow, Parliament has been recalled, and the fundamental question is who is majority still remains unanswered. Martin Pebble is private legal practitioner. He's joining me on Zoom right now for a quick conversation on this matter. Council, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, the council. Great. If you, could, if you could put the camera on for me, that would be great. Um, then we'll also welcome Dr. Rashid Duman shortly um, to, to join us. But, uh, uh, Martin, people, now the, the fundamental question the speaker asks, and y your camera is still off though, but the, the speaker is asking the question about whether there's constitutional crisis or not. He says there is no constitutional crisis, contrary to the Chief Justice's position, and he argues that if the law is applied, as has been stipulated, there would be no confusion about this particular issue pertaining to the four seats that he declared vacant. Which side of the pendulum is your thought swinging to? Oh, definitely. Uh, it's my, Mr. Kansi, it looks like the camera is off from your end. But I hope I can continue speaking. You, you can well, indeed. Yes, you can. Yeah. Now, this, this one, when it comes to the matter of whether there's a crisis or not, mm -hmm. I'm obviously with the chief justice. There is a crisis. There is a crisis. That is how come uh, parliament hasn't sat from the 22nd till date. Ordinarily, they were built to sit every day. So to the extent that parliament is not sitting every day, it is a crisis, but they are trying to resolve it. So the speakers statement that there is no crisis is similar to the Chief Justice uh, statement or the Supreme Court's uh, 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 ruling that the case is a constitutional case. It has nothing to do with party politics. <laughs> I mean, this is clear that the case in the court is a, a political case between NDC and MPP. And it's also uh, clear to us in this case that there is a crisis. That's why Parliament is not sitting. So when the Speaker made that comment, I was like, oh, but is it necessary? He could have just avoided that because when he does that, then he goes back to the statement that politicians usually even some things that are simple and straight, they don't like to admit. So the speaker didn't do himself any favors by raising an issue that is not necessary. That is to say that there is no crisis when there is obviously one. I see, but he qualified that position um, with, with that foundational statement that if the law as captured in our books is allowed to play out, there, will, there is in fact no contention about the decision that he communicated, not a ruling, the decision communicated about these vacant seats, uh, the four seats. But then again, because this has become an issue that the Supreme Court has been invited in, that's what has created this crisis situation. How about that? Uh -huh. So there's a crisis. So the simple thing, uh, yes, he wants to say is that there is a crisis because the Supreme Court has created one. Yes, if you say so, that one, yes. I mean, I will go with him because we all agree generally that the Supreme Court hasn't handled this matter well. So if we are looking for those who have caused it, then uh, the Supreme Court is the number one culprit. 
Yes, that, that, that's it. That one is fair to speak. So you should say it simple and straight. But this circumlocution going round and <laughs> round, it doesn't help. I mean, just go straight, straight talk. Straight talk helps everybody. Rather than to say there's no crisis, then go to say, but if there is a proper application of the law, then there will be no crisis. Which is which? Uh, Dr. Ashid Raman, I mean, uh, the speaker was, was quite concerned and visibly frustrated about what he believes is the collusion between the judiciary and the executive to us weaken parliament. Is that a sentiment you share? Well, Alfred, I, maybe I, I might look at it um, differently, that... Um, yes, there's been some friction between the executive and the legislature, and then most recently between the legislature and the judiciary. Uh, but I believe uh, most of it is, is self-inflicted. Um, rather than our parliamentarians see uh, the institution they belong to and protect it jealously and try to uh, make it strong, so that, I mean, it can stand on an equal footing with the two other branches. Uh, you know, parliament after parliament, we see, you know, MPs, I mean, being kind of um, divided along party lines. Sometimes even when the executive is wrong, they sing the praises of the executive uh, because it is their party in power. And this is applicable to both both parties. And then we also see, uh, particularly most recently, uh, they run into the Supreme Court all the time, um, even on matters that they can just simply sit down and do what we elected them to do, to talk and find solutions. Uh, so in so doing, I think that they open up the institution to some, some kind of um, challenges to the extent that, you know, it's, it's not as strong as the two other branches of government. That's how I will characterize it. Well, that's Most what the, it, the, the speaker did say, that previously in such instances, Parliament has the capacity and the capability to resolve an issue like this by itself. So, really, what, what happened differently this time around? Yes, indeed. I mean, you know, for instance, when uh, the president for instance, said he would not even receive a bill that was passed by parliament. I thought that we were going to hear all parliamentarians from both sides saying that, look, I think that this is now crossing some red line. But we didn't hear that. You know, if we even heard anything at all, it was rather from the opposition. Um, tomorrow, when there is another president in the, in the, in, in, in the Jubilee House, and something like this happened, um, you know, when MPs on the other side start complaining, uh, then, you know, people will begin to ask questions and wonder, you know, where were they when the a precedent was being set? You know, mm -hmm. uh, so when you use that, you, you come to the conclusion that, you know, they have opened themselves up. So I, rather than saying that there is some connivance between the executive and the legislature, the judiciary to undermine parliament, I think I would rather say members of parliament have connived to let themselves get undermined by other branches of government. And it, and this point actually fits into another frustration the speaker expressed over what he described as the legislator's growing habit of seeking the Supreme Court's intervention on parliamentary issues. And, and that, for him, has led to the situation where Parliament is not being respected. Does that, in fact, strike you as one that you would agree with or otherwise? Yes, indeed, Alfred. I would totally agree with it. Like I was saying earlier, you know, when we elect these our leaders to go into uh, the 275 chamber, um, what we have asked them to go and do is you know to go and uh, at 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 all times try and find solutions uh, democracy the practice of it 
simply means uh, that you know you never get 100% of what you are looking for. Um, sometimes you have to um, move to the middle, uh, and and particularly in situations where the numbers are tight. So um, one would expect that in this eighth parliament and at all times, uh, our MPs would try as much as possible in dialogue. Uh, sometimes, maybe at the first instance, you might not reach a consensus or you might not reach a solution. Right. Uh, you go and come back again and right. continue this dialogue until you find a solution. Right. But when you keep running to the court, then you are opening yourself up and then you are setting some precedents that uh, tomorrow might come back to disturb the house. And talk about tomorrow, they are reconvening without the question of who is majority still remaining unanswered. That's a recipe for chaos. Yes, Alfred. Tomorrow, um, <laughs> just just let's all wear our seat belts and brace for for some turbulence because uh, three things are likely to happen. Um, first of all, we might see a repeat of the last time. So two uh, majorities in one house, mm -hmm. um, or we might see a walkout by one of the sides. I mean, just to avoid. Um, some confrontation, or I mean, worst case, we might see a fight. Well, so these are the two, three likely scenarios that uh, we are going to see. Right. Because as the speaker clearly indicated, right. the issues that divide them have not been resolved. Indeed, and we hope that some maturity is brought to bed tomorrow. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ashid Duman, the Director of Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, Martin Pebbles, private legal practitioner. We already have indication of what's going to be happening tomorrow with Governor Kwame Abuja saying they're going to sit at the majority NDC and also Habib Idrisu of the NPP saying they're also going to occupy the majority side. We'll be there to bring it all to you.